Matt McLean is essential for the Cincinnati Reds success in 2024. We'll tell you why we think he will be ready to go on opening day. We've got that for you on today's Locked on Reds. You are Locked on Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Reds, and my name is Jeff Carr. His name is Steve Offenbaker. We are lifelong Cincinnati Reds fans, and we've turned an addiction to this team into information for you. Locked On Reds is part of the Locked On Podcast Network. We are your team every single day, and we want to thank those of you who are everydayers for the Locked On Reds podcast and really making this train go, getting this engine going as we are moving through spring training We are just over two weeks away from opening day, just over two weeks away from one of the best days. You know what? Not even one of the best day of the year. And we are here with you every single day talking about your Cincinnati Reds. And on today's podcast, we are going to look at the encouraging uh, quotes and, and, and things that Matt McClain had to say as to why He says he'll be ready for opening day. We'll give you our confidence level of that. We'll also look at a couple of predictions that we are adding to the list. We'll go over some of the ones that we've already had, and we'll make some. These are not bold predictions. They're regular predictions. But we have a pick as to who's going to lead the team in home runs. And later on, with 15 days away from opening day, who's the best number 15 in franchise history? We'll dive into all of that later on in today's show. Before we get into all right. Before we get into all of that, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, uh, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use the code, all lowercase, locked on MLB for a first deposit match of up to $100. And Steve, where we're going to start today is with the man McLean, because it's very obvious that the Reds need him to have a good first impression to the 2024 season. Well, they absolutely need him. Look, I have talked about him often this off season being a big part of the engine. That's going to drive this reds offense, uh, uh, starting the season out without Matt McLean, I think would be, you know, maybe not disastrous. That might be a little dramatic, but will definitely make things a little bit more difficult. And we have both talked about how, The Reds cannot have a repeat of April's of the past where they struggle for the entire month of April. They need to come out fast. They need to come out hot and they need to build up some wins. And and the season can be decided in that first month. We've seen that happen time and time again. Uh, And to have a successful April, they need a successful Matt McClain. And, you know, what I've learned about Matt McClain, having had the opportunity to talk to him a few times, he did that interview with us while he was still down in the minor leagues. What I've learned about Matt McClain is that he is readily able to identify what he needs to do within his game to work on certain things and be ready. He told us he was going to hit for more power. He went out and did it. He knew the things to do to accomplish that. Uh, If he's telling us that he's going to be ready, I believe him. I do too. And, And he has said a lot of very important things as to why this is going to get done because anybody, any old player is going to tell you, yeah, of course I'm going to be ready for opening day. They want to be out there. But when he was pressed, when they were asking him, okay, cool. How are you going to be able to do that in such short time? McLean had this to say, I just have to stand in on guys and see, you know, I stand in on guys bullpens as much as I can get in live at bats as much as I can. I'll try to simplify things. You don't have as much time to necessarily work on your swing and stuff. It's ramping straight into competitive mode. If I had been hitting the first two weeks, maybe I'd work on my swing a little bit more mechanically. I'll just keep things simple and go compete. And to be quite honest with you, I mean, that's music to my ears. When it comes to baseball, there's there's so much that goes into hitting, but we don't want our guys thinking about that as they step into the plate. Matt McLean understands that, and he understands that the idea, so, so his oblique, the reason that it kind of flared up on him is as he said, he was taking too many swings. And I think it mm-hmm. was all because he got out to Goodyear pretty early. Not saying that was a bad thing. It's just, he got out there and he went too hard, too fast. Well, now, ten, you know, the tendency would be if I'm going to be ready for opening day, I got to go really hard, right? I got to go really fast, right? 
no, you, you got to kind of take it easy a little bit. And he understands how to do that. Well, and the Reds were quick to point out that that oblique strain was in a different area of his oblique. They weren't calling that a re-injury of the same thing that he dealt with prior. Um, I like what he's saying here because the key to being a successful hitter is seeing a lot of pitches and working on your swing. Now he recognizes that he can't overdo it working on his swing, but he has a plan in place to see a lot of pitches. And I know it's a little bit different than in-game action, but as guys are in those bullpens working on their stuff, He's going to get in there and be able to see splitters and curveballs and fastballs and changeups and be able to start getting that eye recognition back. Uh, is that going to hamper him to start the season? It might a little bit. I mean, having you know less time to work on that swing mechanically, as he says, um, it may take him the first couple weeks to mm -hmm. get comfortable, to get back in a groove. Uh, but I have no doubt that he can do that. I, I think the important part is the pitch recognition and a basic swing with good pitch recognition can put the ball in play. Now, maybe he won't hit for a ton of power, but he'll be have the ability to get on base and that's where he will thrive. He'll get on base. He'll be able to steal bases. He'll be on there to be driven in by the boppers further down the lineup. Uh, I'm, I'm confident in his ability to, to put the ball in play in that scenario. Are you describing Matt McClain or Joey Votto? Because I feel like this is the same conversation that we always had about Joey Votto and the way that he started out a season. He never came into spring training swinging. He came into spring training to look at pitches, to get his timing out, to see, you know, see the break on a curve, to see how a splitter drops off the table or something like that. He was trying to see as many pitches as possible. Because of that, he never had spring training stats that really got anybody that excited which mm -hmm. obviously didn't mean a hill of beans because he's going to be in Cooperstown eventually. But the idea is pretty similar to basically what Matt McClain is laying out here. He needs to see the pitches. He needs to, you know, get his timing down and then he's going to get into the swing of things. So let's, let's put it this way. All right. You and I are both confident he can make opening day. What is our confidence level and where they're going to place him in the lineup? because we know that the optimal spot is in the top third, whether it's second or third in the order, something like that. Is that where you're putting him on opening day? Yeah, he's hitting third. It'll be okay. Friedel, it'll be Friedel, Ellie De La Cruz, Matt McClain. That's the top three on opening day. I have no doubt in my mind that that's the direction that the Reds are gonna go with this. Look, um, okay. Matt McClain might be a little sluggish coming out of the gate as far as what he does offensively. He may. Uh, he may have to work a little harder at the plate, but the Reds are not going to drop him down to sixth or seventh or eighth uh, while that process is playing out. They're going to stick him up there in his normal spot. And again, I think he's going to be able to put the ball in play. Uh, you know, maybe the power won't quite be there. Getting around on the ball as often might not be there at first while he still gets that timing figure out, but he's going to make contact. He's going to put the bat on the ball. And in the three hole with, with, potentially Friedel and De La Cruz on base in front of him. That's really all he needs to do because those guys can fly. He puts the ball in mm -hmm. play. He brings those runners around and he sets the table for CES and Candelario and the guys coming behind him. Uh, I think there's no reason to move him out of the top three of this lineup. It's interesting. I don't, I don't think I feel strongly about moving him down, but I could see them being like, well, let's start him sixth or seventh. And then we've got, you know, Spencer Steer batting third and Candelario batting fourth and, and maybe CES or something like that, but in fifth. And then we got McLean who kind of gets the bottom third of the order going. And we don't put as much pressure on him to begin the season to be like, Hey, you are our number three guy here. We can't really have you have too much of a runway. I, I think there is some validity to that. I don't think I'm 100% that he bats third, but I'm not going to be surprised if he is slotted into that third spot on opening day. I, I just, but I love his maturity about that. And once again, we, we find ourselves at a point where we, we are looking at Matt McClain and saying, man, he has taken a mature approach to this. Mm -hmm. He is just entering his second season. He's not even had 162 games in his major league career. And he's already saying things that are like, man, this dude's a vet. Yeah, put the C on his chest, put the C yeah. on his chest. No. I, and listen, I think the fact that he is taking the approach of how to work within what's best for his body, what's best for the Reds, and be able to explain it in a way that it makes sense not only to us, but it needs to make sense to the coaching staff to, to not want to start him out on the 10-day IL. So uh, I love this approach, I, and I love the idea of him standing in and just continuing to get looks 
at pitches. This is something he said he's done before. Um, you know, he's, he talked about doing this in college at UCLA. He did the same thing when he had injuries in college. So he knows that this works for him. He knows that while it's not a direct translation, it's going to help him be ready. And, you know, at the end of the day, we either have to believe him or think that, that he's talking, well, that he's not telling us all of the truth. And I believe Matt McClain. And the Reds need him. The, the, a, a healthy Matt McClain is integral. Did I say that right? Yeah. Integral to a fast start for the Cincinnati Reds. All right, Jeff, we talked about this. There's two weeks to go, just a little over two weeks until opening day. And it's time to add some more 2024 predictions to the list. We're going to do that next. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Conference tournaments are here, which means the biggest moments in the college basketball season are getting closer. To be part of the action on prize picks for both men and women's college basketball, the time is now. Get in on the excitement with prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You could turn 10 into $1,000 with NBA, NHL, and college basketball entries today on prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. You can also put together some prize picks with MLB season stats. Prize picks has Hunter Green's season strikeout total at over, over under at 189.5. Jeff's told you he thinks that Hunter's going to get to 200. I don't think that that's a stretch. I think he can get there. Uh, so it would make some sense to take the over. They also have an over under on total multiple home run games for Ellie De La Cruz. That over under is set at 1.5. So if you think Ellie De La Cruz is going to give you two, multi-homer games in 2024 get over to prize picks and take the over uh, jeff's going to take the over on both of those and we know shocker right uh, just download the app today and use the code locked on mlb for your first deposit match of up to a hundred dollars again download the app and use the code locked on mlb for up to a hundred dollar match on your first deposit pick more pick less it's that easy As you know, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel, Locked On Sports Today. Baseball fans, mark your calendars for March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern time for the best MLB season preview coming exclusively to Locked On Sports Today. On March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern, be the first to get the local insight from the MLB local experts of the Locked On Podcast Network. Everyone is there doing this show. Find it on March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern time on Locked On Sports Today, 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, or on the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Coming up on the next Locked On Reds, the Reds opening day starter, Frankie Montas, is on the mound, and there is one thing we need to see from him. We'll tell you what that is on tomorrow's show. All right, Jeff, it is prediction time. We're 15 days away, which we're going to get into that in a little bit, but 15 days away from opening day. And we do have some predictions on the books now, some of them bold, some of them not. So why don't you run through the list real quick? What do we have on record right now? Yeah, so on the not bold predictions, the regular predictions, as it were, we have the Reds winning the NL Central. We think that's a regular prediction, and mm -hmm. I agree. Matt McClain will be an all-star. You took that a step further and your bold prediction said that he will be an all-star starter. Gonna start. But we believe that he will be an all-star for sure. Frankie Montas is going to make 25 starts and have an ERA around 3.9. No one will play 162 games. And now we add two more. Let's do it. First so one up, I think... Yeah. Christian Encarnacion Strand is going to have himself a season and he will lead this team in home runs in 2024. He'll hit more than Ellie. He'll hit more than Matt McClain. He'll hit more than Candelario. He will lead the pack. I think the only argument here is Ellie uh, because I, I think nobody hits the ball harder than Ellie. I mean, Ellie set stat cast records for the Reds and Statcast has only been around since 2015. But as far as you know, exit velocity, hard hit baseballs, he has set the record in Reds franchise Statcast history, and he did so in his first year. The only thing is, I think volume wise, I would be, 
I, I think it's very hard for me to see anyone else hitting more. I think Candelario has shown he's a line drive hitter and that kind of profile played very well for Nick Castellanos and Nick Castellanos mm -hmm. had a ton of homers, great American, uh, Spencer steer can hit the ball a long way, but Spencer steer is a complete well-rounded hitter, not necessarily selling out for power. Not that anybody's selling out for power. It's just, I feel like Spencer steer is the perfect kind of gap hitter, not necessarily always going to be a Homer guy. I think the only thing for me on CES, and, and this is something that I think is actually a consideration, is what does his playing time look like? Mm -hmm. Out of seven days, is he going to get five, six games? He, he better be playing five or six. You know, I've been seeing this stuff out there and people talking about the lineup yesterday in Goodyear potentially being the opening day lineup. And it was not because CES, yeah, I'm looking at you, Jeff Carr. CES is going to be in the starting lineup. CES is going to be a starter more often than not on this team. Look, he's going to get 140 to 150 starts for this team. He'll be up there among team leaders in games played. Here's why I think he'll lead the team in home runs. He hit 13 last year in 63 games. You know who else hit 13 home runs? Ellie De La Cruz hit 13 home runs, but it took him almost 100 games, 98 games to get to 13 home runs. Spencer Steer led this team with 23 home runs. That's 10 more than what Christian Encarnacion Strand put up. Spencer Steer needed 156 games to do it, more than double the amount of games to get to that 23 total. I think you put CES in this game each and every day, and he's going to get you those home run totals. 30 to 35 homers, well within reach. Uh, he could go beyond that if he has a special season, but I think 30 to 35 home runs for CES, that's not even a bold prediction. That's a regular prediction. He should be hitting four or five in the order whenever he's in the order too. I've seen him as low as like eighth in spring training, but David Bell has said outside of Ellie De La Cruz, don't read into the lineups just yet. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I agree with you. I think that he is a guy that throughout his minor league career has shown so much game power, not just raw mm -hmm. power. You know, scouts talk about the difference between raw power and game power. He has shown so much game power, and I think that will just continue to play out. I think CES is one of those guys that, you know, we've been talking about him a lot this offseason, but there's not a lot of people outside of us that are talking a lot about him right now. I think that will change very quickly into this year. I don't necessarily know that I would fight that. I, I, like I said, I think the only guy I could see challenging him is Ellie, but I'm with you. I mean, I think he's going to hit more. He's Ellie is going to have a home run rate, home run to games rate. I'm talking. About I see. I see what you're trying to here. say. It all um, depends on playing yeah. time. I, I, I got you. Yeah. He's going to have a better rate of home runs this year. Is that better than what CES does? I would have a hard We're talking time talking about that, so. home runs per games played. That's what you're trying to say. Yeah. I'm trying to do math and come up with math equations in my head. Mm -mm. There's no time of day that makes sense for me to do that. But anyway, that that's, that's how you rebuttal this. And, and, and I just don't see that happening. So yeah, I, I would agree with you. That's going down on the prediction list. CES is going to lead the team in homers. I'm going to change gears here. I'm going to look at pitching because I believe that this pitching staff is healthy. I believe that this pitching staff is much improved from last year. And I'm looking at the starting rotation. I think the Reds are going to have three starters that will pitch at least 150 innings. Now, that's the reason that it's not a bold prediction. I think if you want to be bold, you say 180 or more. Because how long do you have to go back to the last time that the Reds had this? Three years, 2021, you had Luis Castillo, Tyler Malley, Wade, and Wade Miley all went over 150 innings. In fact, Wade Miley was at 167, and he was on the low end of those three. And you even had um, Sonny Gray just miss 150 innings because he only made 26 starts. I think we could see something like that here. We talked about the, the magic number of 30 starts and 200 innings and stuff like that. I think that is getting into bold territory. But I think that the Reds will have three starters go 150 or more innings. You might be tiptoeing into bold territory right now because nobody had more than 150 innings pitched last season uh, amongst the starting pitchers. Graham Ashcraft was the closest uh, with 145 and two-thirds innings pitched in 26 starts. So 27 He's starts 
is your magic number. So you're going to need three starters to make approximately 27 starts or more. Um, can, can they, can they do this? Yes, I, I could see a healthy Hunter Green getting to 27 starts, and we've talked about him needing that neighborhood to get to the uh, the strikeout totals that you're talking about. We've talked about him needing to get to the innings pitched totals that we've talked about being you know between 27 to 28 starts. Um, I think that Graham Ashcraft can give you two more starts in a season than he gave you last year. Um, you know, he was, he was Mr. Consistent taking the ball most of the season, every five days. I think he'll bring that same thing to the table. Uh, wild cards are Frankie Montas and Andrew Abbott. We just don't know. Andrew Abbott ran out of gas after 21 starts last season. Now that did include some minor league work in there. So could he get you to 28 this year? It's a big jump. You're asking him to go 50 additional innings, roughly this season over last. I don't know that the Reds training staff is going to let him do that, but maybe he could. Um, and and then you've got Nick Lodolo, who is not going to be allowed he's not, to no, throw he's that not, many. He's no, gonna he's going to be capped. So basically, you're relying on Montas shoulder to give you 27 starts. You're re And then you're relying on Hunter Green and Graham Ashcraft to be a little bit better versions of themselves this year than they were last year, which is doable. But this feels... Bold ish. This is bold adjacent, Jeff. You're you're bold almost adjacent. there. <laughs> and I think and and so I'll clarify that I could just about tell you the three that I think are going to do it. I don't think Montas will. I think Montas will be in the sunny gray range. I think that we're talking about um Ashcraft, Green, and Abbott make 150 okay. or more innings. And the reason that I say Abbott is not because I think that he can make a huge jump in his MLB innings. I think if you put together the innings that he threw in the minor leagues last year and his major yep. leagues, I think it was close to 160. Now that's not to say that those other 50 innings in the minor leagues were anywhere near the same pressure he was facing in the majors. So that could still look a little bold, but I, I believe that his profile of pitching of understanding how to limit the walks and things like that is going to play out the entire year. Same with Graham. 100 and 163 innings total pitched for Andrew Abbott between the minor leagues and the major leagues last year. Can definitely see him throwing 150 major league innings this year. And then um, Ashcraft, I believe, is is a shoe in for this. I could see him being the lone red starter throwing over 200. And then Hunter Green is a little bit of a wild card because he's working on pitches and he he throws hard on the fastball so sometimes that taxes his elbow and you know he gets those short IL stents here and there but I think that he's healthy this year and I think that he will be healthy for most of the season and that will lead him to also cross this 150 inning plateau I I, I can I can see it again it feels it just slightly bold just Boldish, like you know, you typed it in bold, but the printer was running out of ink, so we don't see it really good. It's like it's almost there, Jeff. No, I, I, I mean, I, if it's gonna happen, I think it's gonna play out exactly the way you just said. So, so I can get on board with that. It's gonna have to be those three guys that give you 150 innings each. Well, I tell you this, Steve. Well, those are our predict. We're adding to the prediction list. That our prediction list is now at, and I minimized it. We've now got six, six predictions including the reds winning the division we will have a few more as we approach opening day and then we'll really get into some hardcore predictions on our opening day preview episode that will be coming out on opening day all right let's change gears here because there's 15 days until that wonderful day so who's the best number 15 i think we all know who it is but we're gonna say it coming up next Before we talk about that, let's do some game time because you need game time on your phone, period, plain and simple. Download it today. Use the promo code LOCKDOWN for $20 off your first purchase. You're going to get tickets at a very nice deal. Talk about last minute tickets and, and, and the way that Steve and I love to do this. We tell you, we go down to the banks, post up at a nice spot, get our parking spot all situated, all that. And close to first pitch time, we go in and see what the last minute deals are because game time's got a lot of great last minute deals on some nice seats as well. And if you're, if you're concerned about how the view looks from your seat, game time provides that too. 
you can see uh, your your view from your seat and they have all in pricing. So you know what fees do and, and how it all looks. There's no like, oh, hey, well, this is a $10 ticket, but we're also adding $10 in fees. And so it's really a $20 ticket. They do the all in pricing. So you see exactly what it costs. Download the game time app today and use that promo code locked on for $20 off your first purchase. Now, opening day, kind of rough. The rest of the season, great ticket deals. Checking them out today. Game time. Download the app and use the promo code locked on for $20 off your first purchase. In between episodes, you can follow us on social media. You can follow us on Twitter, X. You can follow me at Jeff Carr with three Fs. You can follow Steve at S. Offenbaker with two Fs. And you can follow the show at Lockdown Reds. There's no Fs in that. Also, bookmark InsideTheReds.com. Writing about the Reds over there. A lot of great stuff over there from Caleb Sisk. He's covering the day-to-day. -day. Uh, myself, Steve, James Rapine. Austin Elmore, Rick Uccino, we're all writing about the Reds at InsideTheReds.com bookmark it today. And join the Lockdown Reds Discord page. Got a link in the description of today's episode. There's a lot of great folks talking Reds baseball there all throughout the season. I know they are excited for opening day. We're all excited for opening day. And it's 15 days away. And we've been doing this series where we, we look at the numbers for each day's away. We pick the best one from reds franchise history it's not nick senzel steve stop it you're you're right it's jim stop edmonds it. we are jim edmonds days jim away edmonds. Oh, jim God. edmonds days away from Ugh. opening day everyone tuned out everyone unsubscribed <laughs> there we go it's it we'll all right we jim clearly edmonds. know that it is the big bad <laughs> george foster the 1977 that's the year i was born 1977 nvp George Foster, part of the big red machine, uh, definitely the best player to ever wear number 15 for the Reds. No, no better number 15. I mean, it's, it's really hard. He, he's a guy and, and, and there's been so much Ooh, talent and, in this franchise and what we would, I, I wanted to ask because before yeah. I forget my train of thought, and now I'm going to interrupt yours. I'm sorry. Somebody in the comment section may know the answer to this. And if not, I might go look it up anyway. But but in 1973, George Foster gave up his number to Phil Gagliano. And I want to know why. It was only That'd for it was only in 1973. Foster wore it in 71 and 72. He wore it for part of 1973, gave it up to Gagliano, and then went back to it in 1974. Is there a story there? Does anybody know? Um, I might go research it later, but if someone knows. Throw it in the comment section. My untrained mind would say it's because maybe he was hurt, but I, I don't know. That doesn't I mean, players that are hurt. Don't give up their numbers when they're on the injured list. That's not a, not a given thing, but I mean, yeah, for his entire career as a red though, 1,253 games played, he had a slugging percentage of 514, and that's no small sample size. That's one big honking sample size for a slugging percentage of over five hundred just a phenomenal phenomenal bat and for those of you who are big red machine fans and you you lived through that era you know how much you love george foster for those of you that aren't big red machine fans like myself didn't get the chance to watch that team just looking back at some of the things that george foster did with a bat in his hand was phenomenal i mean that that mvp season that we talked about 1977 that year he played 158 games and he had an OPS, OPS, on base plus slugging of 1,013. Uh, those are phenomenal numbers. And, I, I and also the same. single season home run, single season home run leader for the Reds at 52. Yep. I, will that, okay, real quick, before we, we talk about some of our other uh, 15s, will that ever be broken? Maybe. We might have a guy on the team right now that could do it. And uh, let's, mm -hmm. let's see how they progress because I think from a raw power standpoint, Ellie De La Cruz has that kind of raw power. Yep. CES, I just told you has that kind of raw power. Yep. Um, is there somebody else on the team besides those two? Mm. Probably not. If no. Reese Hines puts it together and gets to the major leagues, he might have that kind of raw power. Uh, but you know, his window is closing. Balls. So I think, the two yeah. best chances to hit 53 home runs in a season are probably Ellie and CES. Yeah, I think so. That boy, that's a tough number. I mean, you think about 
what was it 2018 2019 when Gino had 49 40, 49 yep and he had I think it was two I know there was one but I think there were two home runs that he had that were robbed he could have had 51 I believe mm-hmm. but even then that's saying that you know you have two home runs that are robbed from you and you still don't get the 52. I mean, that's a, that's a heck of a plateau. And I think it's interesting because we are, we are conditioned when it comes to a home run total to remember the Maguires and the Sosa's and the bonds and the, and the Griffey's when he was with the, with the Mariners and stuff like that and think that, Oh yeah, that can happen. But that does not happen very often. I mean, Aaron judge nope. the, uh, a couple of years ago, whenever he got to, what was it? 63. Um, that felt like something that hadn't happened in it hasn't happened for an age. So I yeah, don't right? necessarily know that we will readily see. I, I, I think you're right. I think we got the talent there. That's just, it's got to get there. And, you know, George Foster circling back to him before we move on to some other number 15s, you know, that 1977 MVP year was the third consecutive year that a Cincinnati red won the most valuable player because mm-hmm. Joe Morgan won in 1975 and 1976. And Jeff, if you're looking at it, you know this already, but do you know who was number two to Joe Morgan in 1976? George Foster. Oh, I did not look that. He not. finished second in MVP voting in 1976 and then won it in 1977. That's pretty good. Finished top That's two in MVP good. voting back to back years. Not too shabby at all. But yeah, a couple of other names on the 15 list that, you know, we'll, we'll, will spark some folks' memories. Dielson Herrera. You, those of us will remember television broadcasts will remember that name. Not really because of anything that he did. It was just how a certain broadcaster said his name. Uh, Roger Bernadina. Remember him? Oh, you're making names no up now. Nobody does. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, Jim we, Edmonds. We mentioned, we mentioned Jim Edmonds. God, we mentioned him twice in the same episode. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Tony you know Womack. What? We got we to gotta say Skeeter Barnes. Skeeter Barnes? Skeeter Barnes. Skeeter Barnes, yeah. Tony uh, Womack. Tony Womack. Denny Nagel. And, you know, here's another guy. We don't have a lot of time left to talk about him, but for the little bit of time he was in Cincinnati, he was really pretty good. That's Glenn Braggs, part of the 1990 World Series team. Yep. You know, I just remember him swinging and missing on a ball and snapping the bat, the bat over his shoulder uh, that he swung so hard and whiffed on. Yeah, that guy had a lot of, of muscle, a lot of power. He had a pretty decent, I mean, it was only three years, but he had a pretty mm-hmm. solid three years with the Reds, 262, 343, 427. Yeah, I, the number 15 does have a lot of interesting names. And then you also had Dusty Baker's favorite player and Jerry Harrison Jr. So yeah. uh, some interesting. And the, interesting and the trivia question that is, what was Barry Larkin's first number before he was number 11? Well, he was two years at number 15, 1986 and 1987. Barry Larkin, number 15. And I think that the reason that we don't pick him over George Foster, I think that's an interesting debate is Barry Larkin over George Foster, but it's because he is definitely the best number 11 that the Reds have ever For had. Sure. So, no, For sure. No and debate that- there. And that's probably a great spot to go ahead and wrap it up for today, Jeff. That's going to do it for this edition of Locked on Reds. Thanks for always making us your first listen every day. Every day is coming up on the next Locked on Reds. We're going to be talking opening day starter Frankie Montas. He is on the mound today out in Arizona. And there is one thing that we need to see from him. And we're going to tell you what that is on tomorrow's show. Jeff, get us out of here. Steve. Everyone knows that we will be locked in on what's going on on the field for the Reds. What's the lineup looking like? Who's playing really well? Jonathan Indy on pace to hit like a billion home runs this year. There are going to be locked in on the rumors and the rumblings and the grumblings about possible transactions, call-ups, things like that. Because we are locked on Reds every single day. We forgot to talk about Dylan Cease. Oh, no. Oh, no.